Right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to Reunion and signing up for this amazing CLE. Uh, we are so excited to have you with us. We know that there is so many things that could have prevented you from being here with us back in South Royalton, and we're so excited that you made this trip and you're back home. And today I get to have the honor of introducing one of your fellow swans and one of our brand new faculty members uh, to you all to lead you in a fascinating discussion on the ethics of cannabis law. Um, as one of our presenters back in the day was all too familiar with uh, the ethical implications that practicing cannabis law might have for his license. Um, a couple quick housekeeping items for you beforehand. Um, we are asking everyone to uh, wear their mask indoors. Um, and then we also have, except for our two presenters, and then we also have our bathrooms just right outside. Right after this, um, please join us for uh, out on the Dev Voice back lawn, which will just be right that direction for you. And we will have our deans meet and greet, where you're going to meet some of the deans. And then afterwards, we'll have our welcome back party, which I hope you all are planning to attend. Um, it should be a great opportunity to get to hear from some of your, connect with some of your former professors, and also get to connect with some of your former classmates. Uh, but without further ado, I want to introduce Tim Thayer, JD, uh, with Vermont Cannabis Solutions, and Ben Barati, who is currently the senior fellow and visiting, uh, sorry, senior fellow and visiting research fellow for the Center for Agriculture and Food Systems, and as of July 1, will be a full-time professor here with us at Vermont Law School. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Ethics Thank in an unethical you. field, right? <laughs> Hello, everybody. For those who don't know me, my name is Timothy Fair. Uh, I am the founder and managing partner of Vermont Cannabis Solutions. It's Vermont's only cannabis uh, law and business consulting firm. Ben, if you want to introduce yourself, we're going to be kind of working together on this presentation Yeah, we're we'll kind of figuring this out as we go. Uh, hi, as mentioned by Ben Barati, I have the very great privilege of teaching business and agriculture law here at Vermont. Law School and I work with the VLS Center for Agriculture and Food Systems where for the last year I've been studying the regulated cannabis industry and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Uh, first thing I want to start out with is the last thing I want to do here on Alumni Weekend is lecture at you. So I want this to be a conversation. Do not hesitate to interrupt me if you have questions, hands up, I, that's fine. It's a free flow conversation. That's really what I want to kind of have here today. Um, there are a lot of questions. I've done this presentation probably three dozen times over the last few years, and one of the consistencies is that people are curious. People want to know about this area. You know, the first question I usually get is, cannabis law, is that a thing? <laughs> and uh, the answer is yes, it is, and I think we're going to get into that. Uh, the roadmap for today, we're going to spend mm, 20, 30 minutes going over an introduction, uh, a little bit of the basics, how did we get here, what about, you know, prohibition, how does the coal memo play into all of this, how can states legally do something when the federal government says it's illegal, uh, and then we're going to really kind of narrow in and focus uh, on the ethics, uh, where we're going to start talking about individual states, state bar association opinions on, well, if you're sworn up all the law, how can you counsel somebody who's breaking federal law? Um, which is an excellent question. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about some of the issues that have been created from the state-federal conflict in the area of cannabis law. And uh, then we'll kind of get into, like, what is it we do on a daily basis? What is the type of advice we give our clients? What are the type of issues we see? Uh, I think we're going to do a little bit on conflict, because uh, uh, conflict of interest is definitely an area in, uh, that can really pop up on you in cannabis law. So before we get started, are there any questions uh, to begin with? Can everybody hear me? Excellent. Never accused of being quiet. <laughs> so, cannabis law 101, and we will then, of course, get into the ethics. So I always like to start out with this. Why is cannabis illegal? Why is anything illegal? Because it's a danger? Because it causes harm? Well, according to Harry J. Anslinger, lovely statement right here. This was back in the 1930s. There are 100,000 total marijuana smokers in the US. And most are Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers. Their satanic music, jazz and swing, uh, result from marijuana usage. Yeah. 
devil's lettuce, right? <laughs> Marijuana causes white women to seek sexual relations with Negroes, entertainers, and any others. Words of wisdom, huh? The root of cannabis prohibition is a racist. This is not debated, this is not a conspiracy theory, this is absolute fact coming right from the mouth. It is horrific. Uh, and when we saw the Controlled Substances Act in 1970, uh, Richard M. Nixon continuing the exact same concept. Prohibition as a means of control. Prohibition as a means of control for groups that the people in power didn't want to hear from. And we can see that again. Coming from John Ackman, who was the counsel and assistant to U.S. President Nixon. You want to know what this is really all about? Two enemies. The anti-war left and black people. Go figure. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be against the war of black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities, we could control those communities. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Again, not a conspiracy theory. Well, and, and if I could just add, you know, this, this was also not really quiet bathroom deals between these two gentlemen or anything like that. Anslinger was in charge of the DEA and his predecessor entities for 32 years and was instrumental in shaping U.S. drug policy with absolute buy-in from all of the administrations uh, throughout, for, throughout that time period. So, starting from a good understanding of where this was coming from, I think we can see why we are slowly moving past rather disgusting concepts. So, um, you often hear the words cannabis and marijuana used interchangeably. This is something we, I want to just touch on briefly. Words matter. Words do matter. Um, there is a little split in the community. Some people stick with marijuana. However, the roots of marijuana uh, are, again, rather racist. Um, back in the turn of the century, 1900s, cannabis was well known. It was an over-the-counter medication. People used it. They liked it. Uh, the public perception was positive. So in order to be able to demonize this, uh, the powers that be decided to start calling it marijuana, with a distinct Latino um, uh, connotation to it. That made it scary. Most people at the onset of Prohibition uh, did not know that cannabis and marijuana were the same thing. So Vermont recently, a few years back, with their legalization changed the word marijuana to cannabis and all of its statutory law. Um, you'll, we all <laughs> kind of interchangeably will use those terms. Uh, but really, it is good to know that when you hear that, this is why there is a strong contingent of people using the word cannabis as the scientific name of the plant, as opposed to marijuana, which is really just a created name. Yeah? So where does weed fall on the list? <laughs> is that just the bottom of the barrel of the pit? That's just another <laughs> slang term, you know. Okay. Uh, we okay. know all of these, you know, terms that have uh, gathered over time, uh, mostly coming out of the 60s. Okay. Um, you know, and again, without that connotation, but marijuana in particular, really was intended to demonize uh, a substance that most people were very comfortable and familiar with. The, um, the driving force there was um, uh, Harry Anslinger's uh, good pal, William Randolph Hearst, who some of you may be familiar with, who really um, uh, worked hard in his newspapers uh, to uh, demonize cannabis and, uh, and, and other drugs at the time, sort of supporting uh, uh, the advancement of, of the prohibition movement, even as alcohol prohibition was was waning. Uh, in terms of the language, it's a little bit, you know, and, and Tim, I don't know what your approach is. Um, in, in many jurisdictions, marijuana is still a term of art within the law, and so typically when I, and I think many of us are referring to the law, we'll still use that terminology while it's acknowledging it, it, it's racist past, but rather than, uh, you know, trying to uh, discuss the Marijuana Tax Act, for example, or without, um, making direct reference to it. So that presents a real challenge. And, and then the other challenge that I think may come up later is that cannabis is a scientific term, right, which can relate to the uh, psychoactive uh, THC-bearing cannabis plant and uh, non-psychoactive hemp, uh, which is largely an arbitrary distinction uh, made, made for purposes of the Farm Bill. And we'll talk more about that. So you may hear us use some other language in terms of THC-bearing cannabis or, um, or hemp, and, and we'll talk more. And it is. Different people use different terms. Sometimes marijuana to describe adult use cannabis. Um, and just real quick, 0.3% Delta 9 threshold created by Congress in the 2018 uh, Agricultural Improvement Act, or Farm Bill as it's more commonly referred to, uh, which is now the federal distinction between agricultural commodity legal hemp, illegal <laughs> Schedule 1 controlled substance marijuana. Um, 
adult use, recreational, you'll hear all sorts of terms, but it is good to start getting an idea of how these terms are used and uh, why certain people will say others. You know, there is also a very strong contingent within the community that says getting away from marijuana is whitewashing. And I think there is an argument for that to be made as well. So kind of within the uh, industry, there is definitely a discussion uh, over which is the best way to go. But important to know that that's why those discussions are occurring. This is also the first point in this presentation. You are going to learn there is a lot of ambiguity in cannabis law. <laughs> There's a lot of we'll see, and we're trying to figure it out, and we'll see what happens. So um, that, to me, is part of what's exciting about it in practice and in scholarship. It's exactly right. You know, we are kind of building the plane as we fly it in this area. Um, there are new developments every day. They say, you know, uh, one year is human years, seven years is dog years. Well, it's about 50 years of cannabis law. So uh, there is a lot growing. There's a lot developing. Uh, if this is something you are interested in, it is critically important to keep an eye on this. Uh, it's not property law that's been established for 200 years since Pearson B. Post. This is something that is really very much in development. Couple definitions, so you know what we're talking about here, and I forgive uh, if anybody does know all of this and it's old hat. Uh, we don't never know how much experience people have. Cannabis refers to all of it. That is a scientific name: hemp, flower, fiber, CBD, which is one cannabinoid within a plant. Um, hemp, cannabis containing less than 0.3 percent delta 9 THC. It's an important distinction. Uh, industrial hemp. That is a type of variety of cannabis, uh, very different from the cannabis sativa. Y'all think about uh, getting from stone, it's actually a very tall, very reedy plant. It's used primarily for its fibers. Medicinal cannabis is uh, cannabis containing greater than 0.3% delta 9 that is being utilized in a state that has created a medical cannabis legalization framework. Adult use is a term we use for non-medical. Uh, you'll also hear recreational. Personally, I like to get away from recreational. Prohibitionists like to use recreational to kind of equate minors and teen usage. I think adult use makes it much more clear. This is not meant for children. This is meant for adults who choose to consume. Uh, high test, high THC is just another term used to uh, describe cannabis containing greater than 0.3% delta. Well, a little bit about the uh, different streams. And Oh, yeah, okay. Um, absolutely. So uh, generally when we talk about the botany of the cannabis plant, we, um, we're, we are still figuring things out, right? One of, one of the phenomena that uh, is a result of prohibition is that there's been very little uh, credible science on, uh, on the, the cannabis plant and its adult use or uh, medicinal capacities. Um, so you all may have uh, at some point in your lives heard about these uh, distinctions between indica or sativa in, in uh, adult use cannabis as, as implying certain uh, expectations about what your psychoactive experience may be. Uh, that's not really super relevant these days for because it turns out that cannabis, like all plants, can have a variety of cultivars, uh, can be, um, uh, have, have a number of different characteristics based on the uh, specific genetics of that plant, as well as where it's grown and how it's grown. Um, and, and additionally, because so many of these plants have been selectively bred uh, throughout prohibition schemes, uh, we find that they are pretty much, all, everything that's available in the commercial market is, is a hybrid to some extent where, where these um, names aren't uh, really super useful. Uh, you heard Tim mention cannabinoids, right? We have uh, more than 60 different uh, compounds within this particular plant, all of which may either individually or in combination have psychoactive effect. Uh, they all have uh, a different range of effects on the, on the end user, depending on what's in, in the plant and also how it's being consumed. Um, similarly, the strain names, uh, again, this is something that's coming from the heritage market. So, uh, you know, what, what may be considered train wreck in California may not be considered train wreck in, in Michigan. There was a, a company that had, had some separate scandal, but was doing a, a sort of 23andMe of cannabis for a while. And, and, and breeders could send in their genetic sampling. And they found that at one dispensary, something like half of all of the uh, products that were being sold on, on the shelf were in fact the exact same strain with different <laughs> names. Uh, so we're still figuring it out, and the, and the industry is certainly getting more professional uh, on these issues. From a practice note, there are separate uh, naming concerns, which I think we'll talk about a little bit. Um, some of the most uh, relevant <coughs> research has actually come out of Israel. 
where uh, cannabis has been legal to study uh, for the last 30 years. And, uh, you know, as Ben was saying, uh, dozens of cannabinoids. And what we're starting to understand now is the traditional sativa, indica, sativa makes you up and wants you to be active, and indica puts you in the couch, and couch life, is actually caused by what's known as the entourage effect. And that is a combination of cannabinoids. And everybody has heard of CBD now. You may not have heard of CBG, CBN, uh, TH. Uh, CD, TA. So there are dozens of these cannabinoids, and the interplay between them, uh, along uh, with what's known as terpenes, which is the smell, uh, the scent, and the flavor that you get, uh, really it's cutting edge. And they're discovering that certain cannabinoid profiles, certain ratios of cannabinoids within a given cultivar, can create different effects. You hear, I don't smoke pot because it makes me anxious. We can't say, I don't smoke pot because it makes me anxious. The particular cannabinoid profile of the cultivar that I smoked made me anxious. There may be another cannabinoid profile that actually alleviates anxiety. Munchies is another one. There is a certain cannabinoid profile that creates hunger. There's other cannabinoid profiles and strains that actually reduce hunger. So it's, you know, and a seminar I recently went to with Dr. Bernard Lee from the Einstein School of Medicine in New York City described it as just the tip of the iceberg. We're just beginning to understand the interplay of these cannabinoids uh, and these terpenes and how they impact uh, our individual uh, neurological systems. So it's fascinating stuff and it's, uh, over the next 10 years, I think we're gonna see a lot more of this science come out. Well, and from a, a commercial and a, and a regulatory perspective, it, it gets pretty interesting too in that we are now at a point uh, where um, it's not just a question of, well, being able to understand this means we can select which dried flowers we're going to smoke, right? We're finding that smoking dried flowers is decreasingly part of a regulated market that includes uh, concentrates that can be made, that includes edibles, many of which are made by extracting all of these different individual compounds and essentially recombining them so we can see more product consistency and essentially um, build recipes to achieve different results or, or flavor profiles or some combination. Absolutely, where, uh, you know, ideally we may be able to reach a point where we can create cannabinoid profiles for specific ailments, for arthritis, for anxiety, for childhood epilepsy, for uh, a range of ailments that right now people are taking three different medications, the first one for the symptom and the next two to deal with the side effects from the first one. Um, you know, and if we can get away from that for more plant-based medicine, I mean, that's a benefit to everybody. So we're just beginning to understand this. We're not quite there yet, but a uh, fascinating area. So, federal law. Um, always do a disclaimer in every presentation. Probably should have started it with this. Uh, marijuana remains a Schedule I controlled substance under the Controlled Substances Act, meaning it is in the highest classification of illegality under federal law. It is a drug with a high potential of abuse and no known medical value. <laughs> Oh, U.S. government. A um, little bit of a hypocrisy, a little bit of uh, uh, the U.S. Pa uh, government has a patent. Uh, cannabinoids have been actually used in FDA approved epidiolex, which was a pharmaceutical created by a company called GW Pharma for the use in childhood epilepsy. Uh, it is pretty much fully acknowledged, even by the prohibitionist medical community, that there are medical benefits uh, in certain cannabinoids and certain cannabinoid profiles, uh, CBD in particular. However, it does remain a Schedule I controlled substance. Um, that is important to know, and if you're ever practicing this area, it should not only be in your engagement letter, it should be probably the very first conversation you have with any of your clients. Yeah, we're, we're, we're certainly gonna talk, talk more about that. It's, um, uh, it's, it, it's a real challenge. Uh, uh, up until you know, 10, 15 years ago, most of the litigation was in this area, really. It was what is um, a generally accepted valid use, right? And, and are there attacks that are gonna get in? Um, to, to challenge that Schedule One designation, um, uh, which, were, which were largely unavailing. Uh, there, there was a whole string of cases that related to the so-called medical necessity defense, uh, mo most of which were um, unavailing. Um, there was a settlement that resulted in a federally sponsored medical cannabis program while still maintaining Schedule One designation. Um, uh, at present, most of the efforts, and I think we're gonna talk a little bit about this on the legislative, federal legislative side, have focused on descheduling cannabis rather than trying to reinterpret the language of Schedule One. So what are some of the issues that are created, you know, from a practical uh, standpoint when we are counseling our clients in this area? 
Banking tends to be one of the first people jump to. Um, obviously, FDIC insurance, federally regulated. Uh, the Bank Secrecy Act, we'll touch on this in a little bit. Some of you may have some experience or knowledge of that. Uh, federal money laundering uh, statutes. Banking is huge. Because banks are federally insured, uh, most banks have refused to accept deposits uh, or even serve the cannabis industry, which has created a, a cash-only industry. <laughs> You're trying to get away from illegality, but you're forcing an industry to act only in cash where there's no real record. Again, the hypocrisy is amazing. Uh, and the interesting part is that FinCEN, which is the Financial Crimes Control Network, that's the enforcement arm of the Department of Treasury, uh, has actually published guidance which will allow banks to work with the cannabis industry. It, it, you know, contrary to popular opinion, banks can bank the cannabis industry. The problem is the requirements in order to do so to meet the FinCEN guidance incredibly onerous. Uh, it is a lot of work on the bank's part, it's very expensive, it's very time consuming, it involves a lot of manpower, and the biggest issue, at least for a lot of the uh, bank professionals I've spoken to, is there is no clarification about what happens if the banks make a mistake. Uh, could they be criminally liable? Are uh, they laundering funds? If it's an honest mistake, what happens? There's no real mention in the guidance about liability, and as a relatively conservative uh, <laughs> You know, group. <laughs> Bankers don't like uncertainty. So that's why we've seen many banks refuse uh, despite the FinCEN guidance. Yes? So, what is this forcing the cannabis and marijuana businesses to do as a result of not having the structure in place for them to manage? Primarily pay $150,000 in taxes every quarter with a big bag of cash. Um, you know, most states unfortunately have had to remain cash only. Now, we're starting to see, you know, some progress in that area. Um, ACH debted, there are companies that are coming up that are providing some solutions, but the overwhelming uh, majority of cannabis businesses are still a cash-only business, which just opens up, uh, we've seen a spat of robberies on the West Coast, um, now with New York City legalizing, I, I mean, I all I can see is visions of, I don't know, Batman movie with just dump trucks of cash coming out of New York City. You know, this really has created an issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, there's a federal act called the Safe Banking Act, we'll get into that in a little bit, that may provide some relief, but even that's not a silver bullet to this. Um, you know, as long as cannabis remains a Schedule One controlled substance, we're going to have issues with banking. Yeah, um, and it, from a, a technical standpoint, the answer is banking is legal if you can get a bank to do it. The, the, the space where we do see some banks willing to dip a toe in the water t tend to be uh, state charter banks rather than federally chartered, but there's a little bit less on the compliance side that they have to worry about, a little bit less that they have to worry about, um, and, and credit unions there. And we are starting to see a rise in um, uh, these, these entities that kind of market themselves as neo banks, right, internet only banks, that tend to actually just be front ends for smaller uh, state, um, and, 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 uh, state charter banks and, and, and credit unions. Um, Interestingly, on this point, you know, when Tim mentions crime, when we, when we look at the survey, when we look at the, the um, public health and, and, and crime research, essentially what it says is, legal for for any given state, legalizing cannabis does not increase crime for that state. It doesn't even necessarily increase crime for that locality. It increases crime for the dispensary itself. It increases <laughs> crime for the farmers, and otherwise, overall, crime tends to go down. Right? These are really attractive targets, and that's one of the major reasons why folks are advocating for change. The other, of course, being that we're talking about an industry that's on track to reach uh, $200 billion uh, globally by 2028, and there is a lot of big money waiting in the wings uh, who, who really want in on this. And we're starting to see that, too, where, um, where a, 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 a lot of uh, bigger investors are making, uh, are, are engaging in investment activity in what, what we call ancillary businesses, right? So all the stuff that isn't touching the plant but can go as far as the point of sale systems that are being used in the registers and the dispensaries. Yeah. yeah. Picks and shovels, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, insurance, this is one with actually, oh, I'm sorry, was there a question back there? I just, so um, I see the plot that does, so does this apply also for like business loans and things like that or that's still doable as long as it's not the deposit? So business loans, you have a couple of issues. One. You still, you still have all of these issues, but separately, what's your collateral? Because there, you can't take collateral on cannabis just because you can't take ownership of it without a license, right? So you're probably looking at personal loans. This is a huge, huge issue. This is a major focus of my research where I, I look at social equity and in, in increasing opportunities for people from prohibition impacted communities. Because re, real world, there is no access to, tra to traditional uh, lending instruments. There's also not access to even 
informational assistance from the SBA. They say, we won't talk to you about what your options are. So mostly you're looking at angel investors uh, and connections, and it, it creates a real application. That is in some absolutely draconian terms in some of these loans that we've seen. Yeah, we're trade. talking about private investment deals with not a ton of scrutiny. And in some places, a few states, a few state regulators have started to say, well, we want to see the terms of your deal because they were getting um, just so usurious that it was just like bananas. We've just that's, seen that's the term of our one where the lender took 20% of the company just for the right to give a $500,000 line of credit at 20%. <laughs> 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 they were like, are you? But what options are out there? It's either that or we go out of business. Right. So that's been a real problem. Yep, Jeff. Um, you, you mentioned that it's, it's difficult with property ownership. I, I understand the issue with the federal property ownership, obviously, the IP issue. But, but the states will protect your ownership, right, if you're in a, a state where it's legal? Common law property? I mean, that's, yeah, we've generally, we, you know, we can get uh, trademarks here in Vermont since it's under state law and it's okay. legal. So you can get state protection. Right now, that actually works pretty well. Most cannabis companies are within states because you can't cross state lines. But once federal prohibition ends, uh, you know, people are looking for the greater protection of the federal registration. Um, so there is a little bit available. Uh, but now what we're seeing is this brand expansion um, where you're starting to have brands now go into multiple states. They don't get licenses. They don't cross state lines with products. What they do is basically licensing deals. So cookies, for example, is a rather popular one. They'll come into a state, they'll partner with a producer, and now they're expanding uh, into multi-states without actually holding a license or crossing state lines. Where once that now is starting to really become and the federal uh, government is not regulating them, I guess because well, I guess they could the federal government doesn't regulate this at all. It's illegal. Mm -hmm. No regulation. Once uh, you get over that 0.3 percent delta nine threshold. So. Well, yeah, and, and it, I I didn't fully hear the question. It's not like it was about trademarks. Um, yeah. it, you know, this there, the, there there is a real time bomb here, right? Because. For every entity you have is really thinking through this stuff and planning it out, and really from a practice perspective and an ethical perspective, right? We have this duty of competence, and we have to um, to really understand all of these different areas of law. I can tell you that thanks to uh, that Dave Chappelle movie, there's a Mr. Nice Guy in every state, <laughs> every single state, and if we do see descheduling, right, and we do see more a greater opportunities for expansion. We're going to be a ton of trademark conflicts, and we're already starting to see some of that. So, Wake and Bakery? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, in, in terms of considering how um, how things are going to move forward, um, it's it, it's a real challenge. And there, there are some other trademark strategies that are probably a little bit beyond the scope of this, where you can uh, seek federal protection on related marks that might give you a little bit of halo protection. Um, and there are some circumstances in which you can see copyright protection on logos and potentially be locking some of that down, but that's not gonna apply to names. That's really for artwork. And it has to, you know, if it's just a pot leaf, it's just a pot leaf. You're not gonna have a lot of enforcement, you know. It's kind um, of like a, like a T-Rex. Leverage there, yeah. In the same situation. Yeah, exactly. So you gotta get the special strain like Jurassic Park does. You gotta have the special dinosaurs. You need the special dinosaurs that aren't the T-Rex. Yeah, you yeah. The special strain that's not the pot leaf. Yeah, for sure. Well, well and, it's a weird color. And strain names Sorry, themselves well, become a real issue, right? Because we, we are seeing increasing <laughs> attempts to um, to protect strain names by uh, folks who are actively marketing them but may not have originated them. Um, and Trademark doesn't care about prior art. Trademark kind of cares about who is currently using it in commerce. And, you know, who's currently using it in commerce in um, California may be very different, you know, than who's currently using it in Massachusetts. And, you know, again, there we have some Concerns. So some of these larger operators are starting to just come up with their own names for, for those other yeah. Um Also, is the federal law, the prohibition used against um, Delta 9 uh -huh. only? Because aren't there other Delta... Yeah, exactly right. And we, and we can talk a little bit more about that. That's a good that question. is an excellent question and kind of one of the hot topics right now, which is, you know, other minor cannabinoids, mm -hmm. uh, which we will definitely get to. Uh, bankruptcy, uh, and then not an option for cannabis businesses. Bankruptcy is a federal process. Uh, so a lot of times, these cannabis companies do not have the protection of bankruptcy. So that's kind of living on the edge right there. Um, and then federal courts. This is an area we are seeing some progress in. Ninth Circuit just recently ruled on a minor cannabinoid case. Uh, of course. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> For the most part, you know, federal courts have been loath to get involved uh, in anything cannabis related. And as we see an industry that's growing to past $25 billion, inevitably there is going to be conflicts. Uh, and the lack of access to federal courts for most uh, conflicts is a real uh, detriment to the industry.
Yeah, well, and we're starting to see that in, in, in some funny ways, too, because the court, one of the reasons the courts are starting to, to, to come into it really has to do with the licensing side. Um, and courts are, are starting to say, well, we can't regulate the cannabis business because that's illegal, but we think we can render some opinions on when states can or can't license um, uh, businesses where, where the issues turn on questions of federal law. Because up until that point, uh, it, was, it was very, very, very common for states to essentially say, well, you have to be a resident of our state to get a license, or we're gonna give preferential licensing to people of these ethnicities, right? And I, you know, I think you all remember enough of law school to know that there's some constitutional issues there, and the states were going with these arguments of like, well, you can't touch us. Right, and you do that enough, eventually some judge is gonna say, mm, maybe we can. So yeah, we started, we started to see some movement, but a lot less than you think, and those um, race and place-based uh, restrictions are still quite common. So now we're gonna get into uh, what is known as the bane of the cannabis industry, and this is something that drives me personally crazy, and it drives, I think, a lot of operators personally crazy, and that is IRC code section 280E. A real brief history of 280E. What 280E states is that any business which tra traffics in a Schedule 1 or Schedule 2 controlled substance cannot take standard business deductions. Now you can deduct what's known as COGS, or your cost of goods sold. That's actually been found to be a constitutional right. They can't take that away from you. Real interesting background on 280E. This came from a 1979 case of the prosecution of a cocaine trafficker in Florida. Um, and as they love to do, uh, this individual was not prosecuted for trafficking cocaine, rather tax evasion, uh, Capone was. So as part of uh, the prosecution, he was assessed a uh, couple million dollars in unpaid taxes and penalties. Turned around in order to get that down, claimed, well, if you're gonna say I needed to pay taxes on my illegal income, I get to deduct my machine guns and my speedboat and my henchmen. <laughs> and the tax court said, you know what? You're right, you do get to take those deductions. <laughs> Congress didn't like that one bit. <laughs> and uh, almost immediately, 280E was passed. Uh, of course, it sat with collecting dust for 20 years until California's uh, medical marijuana uh, program started in the late 1990s, uh, in which what, the IRS had a light bulb go off and brushed the dust off and said, you know what? Well, if you're going to pay your taxes, you do not get to take standard business deductions. This can impart an effective tax rate on cannabis businesses of up to 70%. 70%. Just think about it. Your income coming in, you're paying taxes on that income despite if you've paid payroll, mortgages, leases, equipment, all of those expenses. As a business owner, I love my deductions. Uh, you don't get to take them. So this has really created a major issue for profitability. Um, this impacts dispensaries most of all. Generally, dispensaries can only deduct the uh, wholesale cost of the goods that they are selling. Uh, cultivators, product manufacturers, doesn't get quite as hard. A lot of their expenses do go to cost of goods sold. Uh, but 280E is, uh, is a nightmare. <laughs> uh, and it is one of the reasons that everybody thinks getting a dispensary license is a golden ticket to print money. Um, thanks to 280E, it's really not. Uh, what this has created is a lot of mitigation strategies. Um, and as far as ethical representation of your clients, this is a conversation you need to have. If you do not talk to your clients about 280E, if you work with them to get a license and you've never discussed 280E, in my opinion, you are committing malpractice. Uh, because this is one of the most important parts of profitability of the cannabis industry. And that's what your clients are coming for. They may love the plant, they may believe in it, but ultimately they're business people, they want to start a business, and they want to be profitable. And if you are not familiar with 280E, you should not be advising cannabis companies. Well, and, and, and just to follow on to that a little bit, you know, it, one thing in, in, in my experience, in, in my private practice prior to joining the DLS, is that um, you get quite a lot of folks, uh, clients who are not necessarily sophisticated business persons, or at least not. Uh, when it comes to regulated businesses. Um, you know, you get um, the, the classic, and I, I guarantee you Tim has had this exact same uh, group of clients walk in the door. You have the heritage market grower, the money, and somebody who has some retail management experience or some other kind of management experience. Like that's the classic three people who decided to start a cannabis company together. And what they don't necessarily have is a sophisticated understanding of the nuances of tax law, right? So um, there's really a big part of of these conversations that has to do with, with educating them. And similarly, there's a real perception about the profitability. In the same way that all lawyers are rich, right? 
<laughs> yeah, right, we're all so money as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, profitability, uh, cannabis business profitability, some of the surveys say it's around 40%, right? So um, people are making huge amounts of money, right? There, there is a lot going on and a lot of opportunity here, but there's still what, what we call the green rush, right? This idea that if you get in early, you can make a huge amount of money by doing the same thing. Maybe you were growing some pot in your closet, right? And now you're going to just do that at scale and become a zillionaire and retire. Uh, and that is not necessarily the circumstance, and, and so a big part of uh, client interaction, much more than in other parts of transactional practice that I've experienced, has really been having some of those conversations with clients and really making sure that their expectations are managed so we're not just taking their money to seek licenses that they're not going to be able to act. Set realistic expectations. Uh, that was said perfectly. <coughs> but, oh, sorry. yes. Sorry. So when we talk about like, the tax strategy, that's kind of where I practice, is this mostly related to like a management company renting the employees or having kind of things housed at a different level? And then what's the connection there when you talk about the financial regulations, things like that? Um, do they do they look at the trickle down or are they looking at the, the, the management company? Well, how do you take that? The management company was a fantastic strategy right up until, was it all was that next to the uh, management company? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right up until there was a tax case which said, if that's your only client, you're 280E uh, exactly, you guys, impacted as well. Great example of a strategy that was used that got shot down. And that's kind of what we've seen is multiple strategies attempted to be used. There was one very good case, CHAMPS uh, is known as the acronym, California Health, uh, I forget what it stands for, it's known as CHAMPS, which basically said if you have an ancillary business, that can be used uh, to offset 280E. Where we're seeing that in the modern form is a CBD shop uh, combined with an adult use shop, but they need, there's very, very strict requirements. Separate books, separate bookkeeping, separate spaces. I mean, it needs to be separate. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not quite sure the second half of your question. I don't know if you got that a little more as far as the trickle down, what, uh, if you could. Yeah, it was more, mostly along the lines of like the, the, the um, you know, when you're looking at it from like the financial regulations um, perspective, how far do they dig? So if you, if you come in, and you're looking for banking regulation, you know, banking or financial institutions, insurance, things like that, at that are ancillary business level. Will they do they look at your other holdings as well, or are they looking at it just from that perspective? So the yeah, so the FinCEN guidance is um, is uh, frustratingly vague on this in a way that I think is intended to be a little bit of a disincentive towards that sort of gaming. Because essentially what they say are. Um, here, uh, the Attorney General James Cole under the Obama administration identified 14 issue areas that we are concerned about where we are going to um, enforce the CSA as it relates to the cannabis industry. Outside of that, if you are operating um, uh, in, compliance, in, in state compliance, we're not going to worry about you. And then the FinCEN memo, which was released on the same day, says, yeah, that. Uh, so so ba basically the deal is, um, if you are, uh, are you, if you are um, a bank and you are uh, filing what we call suspicious activity reports, um, when you see the kinds of red flags that were identified under the Cole memo, then you have a safe harbor, you the bank. And if you don't, then you don't, which doesn't even necessarily mean you're facing enforcement. What it means is all that other stuff, right? Well, they, now maybe you're money laundering, right? Maybe. You're subject to asset seizure. Maybe your entire bank is subject. We don't know. Yeah, or maybe not. Yeah, maybe not. So the, the end result, just getting back to the banking uh, thing, uh, essentially we have uh, around 10,000 banks and credit unions in the U.S. Of those, I, I, I believe it's around 700 have engaged in some kind of transaction that required fi uh, filing uh, with an, an SAR, which could be just an everyday state compliant cannabis transaction, or it could be we shut down the bank account of a, of a drug trafficker. Um, and, and we don't have that level of granular detail. But uh, it, it's really putting the burden on the banks uh, to conduct that due diligence, uh, rather than um, that there's some kind of investigative. Uh, Which means anytime anything comes up, they can say, hands off, I don't want to do it. Yeah, well, I mean, what the banks pretty usually do is just say, hey, well, your account is frozen, have a nice life. And the, you know that's one thing when you're talking about maybe the calculated risk that goes goes into uh, you know a, a cannabis producer. I can tell you I personally had a lot of trouble establishing an IOLTA account, right? Going in and being honest with banks and saying, look, I take cannabis clients. Everything I do is in compliance with FinCEN, and my job is literally to help my clients uh, comport with these rules. And, and I finally managed to find one state charter bank that would do it. But yeah, it's a, it's a real issue.
We have two banks in Vermont right now that are willing to bank with our cannabis industry. Vermont State Employees Credit Union and New England Federal Credit Union, both of which just published um, rather exorbitant service fees to do so. Uh, but that's out of all of our banks. Uh, and that does create a challenge. I had my TD uh, trading account shut down, rather, <laughs> rather nasty letter telling me that I withdraw all my money immediately and never attempt to reopen an account. <laughs> I had my Vermont Federal Credit Union account closed on me um, when I started VCS, and we're just off. We don't even touch the plan. Well, and, and keep in mind, and sorry, what yeah, saying, sure. uh, when it comes to 280E, you have that ta the duty to pay your tax, even if your accounts are frozen, even if all your money got stolen because you were keeping it in cash in a safe in the back, whatever. Like, that doesn't get you out of this IRS obligation. <laughs> and then there's separate enforcement that can come along with that. Yeah, pay me. I don't want to ask, if it's, if it's a special secret, you know, please don't feel the need to ask. I'm just curious, how would the bank find out what Gail did? Is it who's making deposits? That's, That's a great good. question. I, I mean, they do audits, so whether it's maybe scanning and seeing a website, whether it's, you know, I mean, fortunately when I started this, I mean, there was quite a bit of publicity, <laughs> you know, it was as the first. So they may be tracking, like, who's making could the could be payments. tracking. I, I think that, you know, what bank internal security procedures I'm not familiar with, I've never worked in banks, but I do understand there are audits that are done on accounts on a regular basis. Um, and if anything pops up, a transaction. I was just reading uh, the International Cannabis Bar Association has a great kind of uh, group chat site, and one of our colleagues had their account shut down because they made a $600 payment for a Cannabis Law Institute, which was just recently held in DC. Simply for their registration fee, that came up as INCBA Cannabis, boom, done. Their uh, account, and their child's account, also closed immediately uh, because of one charge to an educational uh, conference, so. The, um the banking industry has, has released some lists of red flags that, that are suggestive. Um, and, and some of them, we were talking about this earlier. One of them is, if your client is depositing duffel bags full of cash that smell like Febreze. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mentioned this example in class, and my, and my students were like, would that even work? <laughs> I was like, no, it would smell like cannabis and Febreze. <laughs> but, um, Tim, you scared me because I use my business account to actually to the CLE. Yeah. So I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, it's um, not my old though, but my business account. Well, uh, let we us do, know. We do I guess that's other, it. Um, I guess that's the end of it. What's that? I said I used it to pay for the CLE, so I guess that's oh, the well, end there, of it. Oh, well, there you go. I guess you have to be on the um, we, we do see some other red flag suggestions that also include things like when, we're, when banks are trying to establish, okay, well, we have what they call a marijuana-related business, but we have concerns about whether or not they might be engaging in interstate commerce or otherwise violating the Coleman Law uh, guidelines. Um, they say things like, uh, is this entity uh, receiving significant numbers of deposits from out of state, or uh, are they di receiving disproportionately higher deposits than other state-licensed uh, uh, campus entities? So there is some meaning with that. There's an ongoing duty to uh, keep an eye on your clients. They're expected to scan the social media accounts. They're expected to scan news reports. Yeah. Like there is a absolute, I mean, it, it really is ridiculous. I'm sorry, you had a question for that? Yeah, um, relating to the tax strategies for the non cannabis businesses, has that translated into any success maybe just in your client pool um, with those businesses? Um, there were no PPP loans available for any cannabis uh, touching right. businesses. Okay, so that's even still too close. Oh yeah, um, if you're touching a plant, anything federal, SBA loans, uh uh, PPP, uh uh, nothing. Mm -hmm. Now we here in Vermont have not had, we have not started our legal industry yet. So like my firm was able to get a PPP loan. We're ancillary, we don't touch the plant. We're a law firm. Mm -hmm. um, but even now, there was recent guidance that came out from the IRS that they're looking to expand 280, of course, to see if they can't grab more. And there is a discussion now if they may try to uh, rope in some more ancillary businesses um, under a you know a very broad definition of trafficking. Yeah, it seems like they were trying to get some of like the labs that test drugs. Labs are an excellent yeah. question. Yeah. Labs fall under 280E. Are they trafficking? Are they providing a service? They're, you know, that's again one of these areas that it would not surprise me to see the IRS try uh, to make that argument, and ultimately that would have to be determined by the courts. Now this being said, this is still a profitable industry. Even with 280E, at the end of the day, cannabis uh, is big money. This is from, I believe, 2018. This is like eons ago. Yeah, 2018. Um, uh, you know, and the estimated total demand for recreational cannabis or adult use cannabis, 50, 55 billion. Um, and you can see, we're closing in on cigarettes. I bet that gap is uh, much narrower now. You blew past Oreos. Yeah, we're past Oreos, we're past donuts, for crazy. Um, this is a big industry, and it's becoming bigger. 
Uh, and that's kind of like you've got the freight train going and there's an inevitable uh, reckoning to come. The industry is only getting bigger, it's only getting larger. With states like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, those three states alone, the tri-state metropolitan area consists of 60 million people. It's almost double the population of California. Um, states like Florida, states like Virginia, Pennsylvania. Um, you know, as more and more states legalize, uh, this is really going to be coming to a head. And we're quickly getting to a point where the current uh, <laughs> state federal conflict cannot exist. The cracks are getting bigger, uh, the issues are getting larger, and eventually this is going to have to be dealt with at the federal level. Okay. And that's, yeah, that's one question. Um, yeah. This isn't like a, I'm asking for this, like I'm just wondering, you know, you said you don't touch it. I, I worked for an attorney in New Jersey who um, thought he was pretty crafty because, you know, everybody's trying to get ahead of this industry down there, you know, like what you said about grab the licenses and stuff. And he actually put himself into an operating agreement as one of the owners of the license, and he was exchanging, if I remember the operator, I don't care if I blow him up, it doesn't matter. He's, he was exchanging his legal services for an ownership stake in the business that's going to open up the... Oh, how, do you feel about, how do you feel about that? Happens the all the time, and the bar of the ABA has said it is okay. Oh, okay. To oh. take equity in your clients. Oh, okay. What about this? Not in my firm. What about this? <laughs> Yes, I thought you might enjoy that example because it sounds like it's on the border of, you know, uh, it, problems. It, it, it apparently is acceptable. I, you want to touch on this? Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, I, every, I'll say this, every jurisdiction I've looked at has ethical guidance, not related to cannabis, that just says, can you take a, uh, equity in a, in a client? Yes. Is it a good idea? No, it's a terrible idea. Terrible idea. Right. <laughs> um, because now, like, what are the chances you're going to end up in a conflict with your the, the one little narrow exception where it might make sense is if you're house counsel or if you are legitimately the founder of, I don't know, say a cannabis wholesale <laughs> company. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, to, to, to the extent that, and, but the reason why it comes up particularly often here, I, you know, I think it's partly because so many of these entities are startups and it's partly because, again, we're talking about sometimes unsophisticated clients. Many, many, many clients ask me if they, uh, if I'd be willing to exchange legal services for equity. And many, many more just ask me if I want to invest because they're all convinced that they're going to be the next big thing, right? And lawyers are rich. What? And lawyers are rich, yeah. So it's, it's going to, it, it comes up a, far more in this industry than anywhere I've ever seen it in a, in a fairly di diverse um, career. So yeah, from, from an ethical perspective, essentially, what the guidance in, in every, um, in every uh, jurisdiction says is you can do it if you're careful and they don't offer a ton of guidance about what that means, is it, and as you all know already, without us getting too deep into the ethics conversation, uh, that can be almost impossible to do. And particularly if you're maintaining any other clients in that industry. Just think of the practicality. You've taken equity stake in one of your clients, but not in another, and then you put in applications for both of them, and the client that you have the equity stake gets their license, and the one that doesn't, doesn't get their license? I mean, come on. Uh, you know how many professional responsibility complaints you want filed against you? There's not an endless amount of licenses, so that's almost inevitable. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, 27 states right now have license caps, um, which which means there are a limited number to uh, to go after. So that, that becomes a real issue. Another issue here, just from a practical perspective, how are you going to fire your client? Like, every, right. So you have to write up these like really complicated agreements, which, by the way, have to be arm's length transactions. We know that. I think it's. Uh, I've got it later in my notes. I want to say it's like 1.8 ish. Um, have to be arm's length transactions. You have to advise the client that they need that they are. It's you need informed consent from the client, and you have to advise the client that they should get their own lawyer for the purpose of entering into a contract with you on that deal, right? So what's that lawyer going to say? <laughs> right? Yeah. So yeah, there there are situations, the very narrow situations where it might make sense. Mostly when it's the lawyer who happens to separately be a cannabis entrepreneur and is looking for investors. Yeah, and it's, you know, uh, our firm will not take an equity stake. And a lot of small startup companies, because they don't have access to the financial markets and they need legal services, that's the first thing they throw out there. Yeah. Um, our firm, uh, we absolutely have a straight ban on that. We also will not take vendor uh, kickbacks. Like, you know, we'll get, I get vendor calls all day, every day. Uh, get, get, get your clients to get our POS system or our suit sale tracking system or our insurance or our whatever. Uh, we'll, keep, we'll give you 10% back, our security system. Uh, you know, we absolutely will not take any of that. It's just, you know, whether or not it's actually ethical, I think could be debated by you know the you know the appearance, the optics on it. Uh, never, uh, but not all cannabis lawyers feel the same way about that. Um, sorry, I just checked. It is uh, model rule uh, one point eight, ABA model rule one point eight uh, that essentially says that. 
No. Uh, so we're going to kind of cruise through this a little bit. Uh, hemp and CBD, most of us know. It's, we're starting to get a little time here. I want to get to our actual solid ethics. Uh, real quickly, industrial hemp, okay for years, right up until uh, the Marijuana Tax Act, then hemp bad, then World War II, hemp good, then World War II ends, hemp bad. Um, you know, kind of whenever it was convenient. Um, 2014 Farm Bill was the first to address this issue, established a pilot program. This was really kind of the onset of where legalization became a reality. Your Colorado uh, first uh, experimented with legal cannabis. Uh, hemp was finally defined as cannabis to keep it containing less than 0.3% delta 9, that rather arbitrary limit, which is really based on absolutely nothing. Um, and then also for, presents, for, for your clients, presents a real issue because trying to grow hemp that's going to be under 0.3% THC can mean you have to harvest early so you don't so you don't risk it. Because 0.3 is really not a lot. And there's, so there is some political movement to try to increase that to 1%, which would still not be psychoactive, uh, but would leave a little bit of buffer there so you're not trying to test your crops out of the field um, just to risk compliance, not compliance, because if, if you do test hot, um, there's not really much of a, an opportunity to remediate. Um, the, the one bit of relief that we now have is that you can till over that crop rather than taking it to a DEA for approved reverse processing facility, which honestly nobody was doing anyway. Yeah. And uh, you know, originally it was 0.3% delta 9. Now they've adopted what's known as a total THC uh, threshold, which is THCA. When you have a plant, you eat a cannabis plant, you're not going to get hot. That's because a majority of the delta 9 has not been converted into delta 9, it's THCA. Decarboxylization is the process by which heat is applied, it converts the THCA into delta 9. So when it was just delta 9 in the plant, that was doable, challenging, but doable. With a total, when you were factoring in that THCA as well, practically impossible uh, to meet that standard now. So uh, interstate commerce of CBD is allowed after the 2018 Farm Bill. That was really kind of the breaking of the dam, so to say. That uh, created a interstate commerce. That created uh, CBD showing up at your gas station. Um, not a lot of regulation. Not a lot of clarity. Uh, but this is really what a lot of people do view as kind of the introduction to mainstream society of cannabis. Uh, interestingly enough, CBD by itself is an isolate. It's a modulating molecule, meaning it doesn't really have. It's not an active molecule. It works in conjunction with other cannabinoids. It affects CBN and CBG. CBD by itself does actually very little, slight anti-inflammatory properties, but if you ever see a CBD isolate, it's kind of pointless, just a word of wisdom. Um, sorry, just, just a quick sort of general point on hemp and CBD. Um, a, a lot of people, clients in particular, think, well, it's hemp, so it's, it, it's allowed under the farm bill, so I can do whatever I want. It's in the gas station, must be fine. Keep in mind, um, uh, CBD is still uh, considered an adulterant by the FDA, such that food that has CBD in it is no longer food. Uh, there is no such thing as a CBD supplement. Um, and this is a, a can, can get pretty treacherous pretty quickly. So if you're talking to clients, and again, you do have these ethical obligations to advise them on the potential out, uh, um, results of their, of, of their contemplated actions, um, we have, we're not seeing outside of um, some very limited examples, which, which Tim is going to talk, to talk about. Um, this sort of, there, there's this popular conception of, oh, CBD isn't regulated, we can do whatever. And from a client, uh, from a representation standpoint, that's absolutely not the case. And you can see it. Uh, Massachusetts prohibits CBD in food. Vermont, on the other hand, the exact opposite term. And our department of agriculture says, go ahead, put it in food, we don't care. <laughs> you know, directly in contradiction to FDA regulations. But FDA has not enforced it. Where the FDA has enforced it is health plan, right. medical plan. If the CBD is saying this is going to cure your cancer, this is going to cure your athlete's foot, this is going to cure your anything, that is where we've seen the FDA through the FTC taking enforcement actions against companies making medical claims with the justification that somebody may see this and forego actual medical treatment for something that is unproven, which frankly I don't have a problem with. I mean, when you're making you know unsubstantiated claims that this is going to cure cancer, uh, no, it probably won't. Um, you know, so that's where we've seen it. But technically, Ben is absolutely correct. The FDA has said CBD is a active drug ingredient in epidiolics. It's a FDA approved medication. Therefore, if it is part of a medication, it cannot go into food. Uh, however, without enforcement, who cares, right? Well, clients need to care. Uh, and you need to be able to make sure that they're aware that what they're doing, while maybe okay under Vermont state law, uh, could potentially expose them uh, under federal law.
And this is this is a big conversation, right? And you, I think you're probably all getting the flavor of this in general with conversations with these clients is, what is your exact risk tolerance, right? Whether we're talking about potential enforcement under the Controlled Substances Act and, and we have you know, the Cole Memorandum and we have uh, A.D. Garland saying, well, we only care about international and interstate commerce, you know, all the way down to, well, the FDA could, but they haven't, right? It, it's about having those, and documenting those conversations with those clients to really say, I have advised you of these risks. It's up to you, right? And ultimately, it will be. Yeah. We talk about the spectrum of risk a lot in my office with our clients. There's a spectrum of risk. This is not a risk-free industry. If you want a risk-free industry, something shifts. You know, when you're getting into the cannabis industry, there you are taking on a level of risk, and that can be extreme, and that can be mitigated to the best of our ability. But that is a spectrum of risk. Um, so moving right into state law, this is where we see uh, high or adult use, or ITHC, or whatever you want to call it, uh, become regulated. It's not under federal law, of course, it's under state law. Again, this map's slightly out of date. Um, this was probably, I think, 2019 when I put the slide together. Uh, some more states now have moved forward, but gives you a good idea. Legal for adult recreational uh, use, dark green. Legal for medical use only. Uh, no program at all for legal THC. Uh, status pending, Mississippi, for example, has adopted a very restrictive medical program. Um, but as we're seeing more and more, and every time, every year, you look at this map, there's more and more green because more and more states are coming online. At this point, there are what, three states left with absolutely no uh, laws on the books? Nebraska, Iowa. I think it's a little more than that. It's 38 is the number I got. With nothing, with none, I mean like low THC medical? Oh, no, 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 yeah, then I think you're right. Yeah, some sort of, you know, at least like low THC, you know, under 0.3 medical allowance. Um, and it's just more and more every year. Every state that votes on this passes it. Arizona didn't pass its first time, and then two years later did pass. Uh, that's the only state I can think of that actually rejected it. A lot of times, once a state passes it, their, you know, executive branch will attempt to reverse it or challenge it. But really, um, this is 66% of Americans now live in a jurisdiction that has some sort of legal cannabis, and that number also continues to increase almost on a daily basis. Um, it, it's inevitable. The grassroots movement for legalization is huge, and it is happening. When I started um, my research, I, there was a, a statistic that I loved, and I'm a little, it, it's great that the numbers are changing, but it used to be the Washington um, Post did a survey, and um, at the time, uh, the, the survey results were 54% of Americans said that they had ever tried uh, cannabis, and 54% of Americans said that cannabis should be legalized. <laughs> um, um, it's, however, it's now actually substantially higher. It's, um, we're, we're looking at um, upwards of 92% of Americans say that we should at least be allowing medical programs in, in some format. Although, you know, the, the nature of those programs varies very much. I, I, I began my career in, in Louisiana, where there is an active medical program that's run through pharmacies and only allows um, I, th I think it's uh, edibles and topicals, and, and Florida similarly, I think, is still, or at least for a while. Yeah, for a while, they allow smoke now. Yeah, like New York's medical program is exactly like that thing. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the nature of the programs can, can uh, vary quite a bit. In Florida now, you know, and just for a great example, Vermont with its restrictive program had about 5,000 medical patients out of its peak. Uh, I just talked to a practitioner in Florida at a recent uh, the kind of salon institute in DC. They're closing in on 800,000 medical patients. <laughs> you know, so it's like, why even bother at this point? But uh, medical programs can vary dramatically from state to state, whether it's qualifying conditions, whether it's products available, um, whether it's amount of dispensaries, whether it's cost. So uh, it's hard to say, you know, or even compare state to state. Um, you know, why continue, you know, once medical adult use, this begins to merge. Uh, Maine is making an attempt right now to have two separate regulatory structures for their medical and adult use program. It's not going well. And ultimately what ends up happening is, much like Washington State, the programs merge. Medical patients will uh, often not pay sales tax, will have access to higher milligram uh, edibles in a lot of cases. But for the most part, uh, once a state has passed adult use jurisdictions, what we generally see is the programs merging into one program. There's, um, there's, there's one more reason actually that I, I personally, I, I began my cannabis practice in Oregon, uh, where the medical program is like almost completely finished. There are something like um, nine medical dispensaries remaining in the state. But the location of those is interesting because they are in what are what are otherwise prohibition counties, right? So these are counties that have said um, we are not going to allow adult use cannabis, but by operation of state law, there's there's uh, more flexibility there for the medical program. So we do 
see a little bit of that as well. That's interesting. Yeah, but again, uh, I, I knew quite a few folks who were uh, originally drawn from those medical programs, and they ended up um, in really rough shape because if you only have nine dispensaries, it turns out they're all vertically integrated, right? So the way the Oregon program is, is structured, um, a, a, any individual can register as a grower for one or more patients, I think up to four, and they can privately negotiate for what's going to happen to any overage that isn't consumed by that patient. And it used to be that that overage uh, was captured by the medical dispensaries. As the medical dispensaries went away, that overage became an issue, and that becomes a, a situation that's ripe for interstate commerce and abuse, and, and so there's a regulatory concern there. And there's also a lot of concern from the regulated market as a whole that uh, if, we, if we don't do something to address that issue, uh, it, it could hurt the credibility of legalized cannabis as a whole. So. Um, Again, this is an area where it can be important to advise clients of. It can be easier in a lot of jurisdictions to get a medical um, producer license. Uh, and there may not be the same license caps, uh, but there is increasing scrutiny there. Absolutely. I can kind of move this. Uh, get a little bit into social equity. Um, this is an area in which Ben has spent a lot of time working. <laughs> I, I spent the last year on it, and honestly, I could have done two hours just on this. I created an entirely separate PowerPoint that we're not going to do because uh, we, we are um, uh, running a little bit behind. Uh, what, what I'll tell you in general is this. So um, governments are not blind to the racist history of cannabis regulation. In 2015, the city of Oakland had uh, created an office of, see, I'm not PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> let me see if I can at least take a look at it. Uh, created what I believe was the office of, um, I didn't even put it in my de department of Ra race and equity, and, uh, and, and so what uh, they uh, were tasked with is, is an increasing model that we're seeing generally outside of the cannabis world is we're going to look at every single piece of proposed legislation and see how what its impact is going to be on our most at risk populations, right? Which uh, 2015 was right around the same period of time when California was becoming very clear it was going to be legalizing adult cannabis, and so one of the first uh, pieces of work that the city of Oakland, um, that this office did, was uh, help enact uh, rulemaking that said, um, we are going to have license caps and 51% of cannabis uh, businesses uh, have to be owned by, at that time, <clears throat> people convicted of cannabis crime or residents of areas with disproportionately high cannabis arrests. Um, this was a very, very popular idea. A number of cities followed suit. Massachusetts uh, became the first state to do it the next year. Uh, and since 2016, all, I believe every single state that has enacted uh, adult use um, uh, legalization since Massachusetts uh, has included a social equity component. The quality and nature of those programs varies very significantly. By far the most important part is uh, the fastest to talk about it. It's criminal justice reform and expungement. Right? If we say cannabis is no longer illegal, what we're also saying is it's going to be a lot harder to show probable cause based on the smell of cannabis. Right? It's going to be a lot harder to engage in racial targeting based on cannabis use. It's going to be a lot harder to send uh, folks to jail on, on pretextual searches or on pretextual arrests um, based uh, specifically on cannabis. And, and, and right there is the start of kind of undoing Anslinger's whole strategy from the uh, 30s and onwards. Um, uh, the expungement piece is interesting. We have, um, I think, four or five states that um, that uh, will automatically uh, expunge um, uh, conviction records for nonviolent misdemeanors. Uh, a few more are doing it uh, for certain felonies. Um, I think we have a, a total of around 11 states that allow uh, either either automatic expungement or application. Are, are we all clear on what expungement is? Yeah. Yeah, right? So we're actually erasing that criminal history. We're not just sealing it. We're not just uh, uh, saying, well, it's okay now. We're actually erasing that, which means that you have huge implications for stuff like um, being able to rent properties, being able to get jobs, being able to get government assistance, and go to school, and all these other things, right? Huge, huge, huge piece. From our perspective, um, it, it comes up in two ways. It comes up, A, because we may have clients who say, hey, I want to get my record expunged, right? And, it, it, and it's important to, to at least be aware of that and refer to somebody if that's not a practice area of yours. Um, may, uh, many jurisdictions also have uh, grants specifically for expungement clinics. VLS has in the past had an expungement clinic. We're working on bringing something back. Um, so uh, there's there's some cool stuff that's, that's happening in that 
uh, area. Um, a couple other jurisdictions, Colorado did a, a, an automatic uh, governor's pardon while they're waiting to try to figure their expungement stuff out, which a pardon, of course, not an expungement, right? So not quite as strong, but still, but still and within Colorado, I mean, enough that, that the industry there is, is influential enough that when it comes to stuff like, can I get a lease, um, you know, maybe less of a concern, but we still have some uh, issues with federal programs. Um, uh, the, the other two sort of major buckets of social equity uh, regulation, community reinvestment, we're going to talk about very little today. Uh, because this is not something the practicing lawyers are getting super involved in from a policy standpoint. It is a horrible mess because almost 100% of those states that have legalized in any form claim that a portion of the excise taxes they're collecting are going towards reinvestment in the communities that were impacted by prohibition. It sounds great, right? We acknowledge that there are these communities that were disproportionately impacted, that were targeted. We understand about equity versus equality and we want to do the right thing. Um, and the outcomes of that have, have largely been terrible. So the um, uh, city of Portland, Oregon, is doing better now. But when they started, it turned out that um, something like 80% of the uh, excise taxes that they collected were going directly to um, uh, traffic improvement and, uh, and police and enforcement. Law well, enforcement, go figure. Yeah. <laughs> so, OK, that was, you know, that was 2019 that that came out. And they've, they've you know, moderated and whatever. Um, in Arizona, uh, they have they have a, a, a program that uh, donated uh, 176 thousand allocated 176 thousand dollars, give or take, to community reinvestment. Um, during that same time period, I, I want to say it was 11 million dollars went to police and fire out of the 33 million that they collected. In so you know, I, I can show you a chart. It's like yeah, they all have these community reinvestment programs. Some of them are really good. Some of them are working. Lots of them uh, are not. And what we're seeing here, and this is really a theme of my research and something that comes up I know a lot uh, for Tim and for other folks who work in the field, um, is that we see problems of implementation. right? So we, when it comes to social equity, we have these great ideas about how we can address these big social issues and how we can take all of this money of converting a heritage market into a regulated market and, and really do something good with it. And then we tend to be giving it to um, uh, folks who are lifelong bureaucrats who have their own agendas and some of them are really well-intentioned and want to do the right thing and others see this as an opportunity to increase the general treasury. So sometimes we see programs that say, yeah, we're going to invest all of this money in this particular community, but we're also going to reduce these other budgets by the same amount, right, so our general treasury. So this is a mess. If you're interested in the policy side of this, if you're interested in the activism side of this, I'd love to talk to you about it more. Um, from a CLE perspective, the, the final piece, which is a little bit more re relevant, is that um, we see equity programs that are trying to um, increase participation in the cannabis industry among prohibition impacted individuals. So that can be people who have arrest records uh, for cannabis uh, crimes. That can be uh, people who come from neighborhoods that were disproportionately impacted by targeting. Um, again, here the quality and nature of those programs. Uh, differs quite a bit in the 27 states, 28 states that um, have license caps. What we are increasingly seeing is a set aside of a certain number of those licenses for individuals uh, who come from those backgrounds. Um, uh, we often run into uh, issues in that A, it's really expensive to start a cannabis company. And if we're saying, oh, we have for generations, America has. Um, you know, targeted these, these communities and these individuals and taken away all their opportunity and taken away all of their um, opportunities for prosperity. But hey, guess what? We're reserving 15% of our licenses so that if you can just come up with 500 grand to start a dispensary, it's all yours. Right, so there's a real problem there. And the, and the biggest issue really becomes access to startup capital, as we've already talked about, um, that presents a lot of um, challenges of its own. And regulators are starting to acknowledge this. So. Uh, in New York, for example, we're seeing our first, uh, our, our first situation of a public-private partnership where New York very proudly announced that they're going to be doing direct lending of $200 million to, um, to social equity applicants. They did not publicize quite as much that $150 million of that is private investment. So, um, so uh, they're, they're structuring it such that the state of New York is establishing the eligibility criteria and administering the program. But on the back end, uh, there's a lot of big money that's seen this as an opportunity to invest in the industry. Um, so that's one model that's, that's being looked at. Some of it is um, 
is uh, Vermont also has a direct lending thing, but it's like half a million dollars. Two hundred thousand dollars. That's why I thought that was yeah. interesting. That number you pulled. So yeah. One so, person can open a dispensary. Good luck. Yeah, there's one. Yeah. So you know, for that one applicant, that's going to be really super. Um, and, and similarly, we see programs that say, "Oh, we're lowering barriers to entry because social equity applicants don't have to pay the licensing fees." Well, great. You don't have to pay two thousand dollars. You just have to come up with the other four hundred and ninety-eight, right? You're um, building. You're the, insurance. But, <laughs> But from y'all's perspective, right, from a practice perspective, it's important to know that these programs exist, that they do tend to involve preferential licensing, whichever side of it you're on. Many of them are still place and race-based, so if you have problems with it, there are probably dormant commerce clause issues with it, there are probably um, equal protection issues with it, and even if you don't have problems with it, you can expect, anticipate that litigation will be coming down the pipe, uh, and states are not historically building in kind of buffer periods, so they say, well, we're gonna use these place-based restrictions and then we're gonna um, just see what happens. And what happens is there's litigation and now all of those people from those disproportionately impacted communities don't get their licenses at the same time as everybody else. Vermont actually has some protections built in. Um, one of them being that they're not license capped, but two, if they get those kinds of challenges, um, all license issuance uh, halts until they're resolved. So, it's an iterative process, and that's really what we're seeing with social equity regulation, with cannabis regulation as a whole, is that you know people launch these programs, they sound great on paper. Um, Illinois, we were joking about this earlier, because Illinois was, was perceived as the gold standard when they came out for what these programs could look like, and they, um, at the last minute, said, well, in addition to coming from one of, they, they, they did a, a kind of points-based licensing system, right? So it was like, whoever scores the highest gets, gets the license, and if you're a social equity applicant, you get a few extra points. When at the very last minute they said, you know what, it's not just going to be individuals from these communities, it's not just going to be um, people who um, have, uh, come from these backgrounds, it's also going to be veterans, right? Well, that changes the entire landscape, such that the only person of color who received a uh, license in the in Illinois uh, initial attempt was the former police superintendent, um, who was subsequently disqualified, not because that's crazy, but because his partner worked for KPMG, which was the audit firm that's with assigning the points. So uh, Illinois has gone back to the drawing board. They are releasing 110 more licenses. They're trying to fix it. But that's something we see a lot in this area is good ideas, uh, failures of implementation, uh, and hopefully, I, I remain hopeful, a level of iteration that's ultimately going to uh, result not only in models that work well for this industry, but, and this is a focus of my scholarship, um, create some models that might apply to other industries as well. Um, but for your purposes, know that this exists, know that it tends to manifest as priority licensing and perhaps some funding opportunities. Um, and then separately in California and a couple other jurisdictions, they're also looking at situations where licensees um, can uh, either qualify as social equity uh, applicants or get uh, some other beneficial status if they agree to serve as incubators for other social equity applicants. Um, and, and that can present some real interesting opportunities for partnership for folks uh, who, are, who are interested in exploring. Well, should we just like a five-minute break and everybody else? Yeah, it works for me. How yeah. is, how y'all doing? Everybody, okay, man, bathroom, just take a quick five-minute break. I just want to uh, I agree. real quick. Okay. While we have been discussing ethics in a lot of different uh, areas, we're gonna focus now on the actual rules of professional conduct that we all as cannabis lawyers, keep a very close look on. Um, and starting with what is probably the single most important rule to consider when it comes to cannabis law. Uh, this is the Vermont Rule of Professional Conduct, but you're gonna find this in every single state, 1.2D. A lawyer shall not counsel a client to engage or assist a client in conduct that the lawyer knows is criminal or fraudulent. But a lawyer may discuss the legal consequences of any proposed course of conduct with the client and may counsel or assist the client to make a good faith effort to determine the validity, scope, meaning, or application of the law. Okay, that's the long version. The short version is you can't help your clients break the law. Um, and that really is a very uh, cornerstone of our ethical duty, our ethical responsibility uh, as attorneys. Anybody had this come up like outside of the cannabis context, but in a context they can talk about? Because I feel like uh, maybe I just I don't know who's my clients. I felt this came up more often for me before cannabis law. Yeah. Um, I now actually work in attorney ethics uh, in New Jersey, and I, it more comes up with like fraud if it's like business 
Yeah. Broad type yeah. thing. We had that in Columbia State, but not very often. I, I just not usually it. criminal. Oh, sorry, yeah. go there. Yeah. Just the, I mean, just the whole legit. I, I'm a family law attorney, and the amount of times I have to tell people I can't talk to you about taking your kids. Yeah, so what if I just take my kid? What I got, I did a fair bit of real estate insurance, what if I just tear down the fence? Or what if the fence just disappeared? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, so the meeting say, you know, if the judge says this, I'm going to where, and I'm like, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hear it. Yeah. Or a client um, saying that he'll lie, perjure himself, you know. Yeah. Well, and what's important here, right, is, is, um, but, right, but, we can discuss the potential outcome. Right? And I've certainly had situations where it's, well, I can't advise you to do that, but if you do it, you might get a ticket. Yeah. Right? So this is this is like pretty powerful language if you read the entire thing. Yeah? No, I was just going to come in that I do a lot of bankruptcy work. And people are like, okay, oh, yeah. I can just get rid of those assets. And I'm like, you cannot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're going to talk about, about how this has all been modified, but also just as it stands, we've got that very powerful but. We can discuss the legal hospitals, right? Because that comes up a lot for us. Can I sell seeds? That's a question I think I've heard about 5,000 times. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> you cannot. <laughs> Nobody's going to prost. Everyone's doing it. Everyone's doing it is another great one, you know? Yeah. I, I know everybody's going to jump off a cliff. I feel like it's my mother talking when I was five. <laughs> but um, this is a real serious issue to keep in mind, and one that really uh, is very, very important uh, in our uh, area of practice here. Um, so, how was this dealt with? Well, in 2016, as cannabis was getting bigger, as hemp was growing, as CBD was starting before 2018, but with the 2014 pilot program, Vermont did allow cultivation, obviously this needed to be dealt with. So, with respect to paragraph D, a lawyer may counsel a client regarding the validity, scope, and meaning of Title 18, chapters 84, 84A, and 86, which are our, well, the precursors to our current cannabis laws, but our hemp and CBD laws. Uh, other Vermont statutes annotated and may assist a client in conduct that the lawyer reasonably believes is permitted by these statutes and rules. Meaning, you're a state authorized profession, you're a state regulated profession, you can advise your clients on state legality. Uh, in the statute rules, regulations, and other state local provisions implementing the statutes. In these circumstances, a lawyer shall also advise the client regarding the potential consequences of the client's conduct under related federal law policy. This is the important part. Very important part. When I talk to our state ethics guru, Mike Kennedy, for any of you who practice in Vermont, you probably know Mike. I can tell you know Mike. Mike is a wonderful, wonderful human being. I got to meet him after he was disciplinary prosecutor. So some people don't have such a great vision of him. Well, to me, he was like, God, my guiding beacon to get through this the right way. Uh, the first thing you must tell your clients is this is illegal under federal law. In our uh, engagement letter for both our retainer clients and our flat fee clients, in big, bold capital letters, cannabis remains illegal under federal did law. Did you remember the start of the PowerPoint? Hmm? I, I did, absolutely. Yeah. Disclaimer at the beginning of the PowerPoint as well. Yeah. This is something that cannot be stressed enough, you know, much like this is not legal advice. Every time you talk to anybody, well, cannabis is illegal under federal law, and that is important. There was a case, I think, out of Florida where a lawyer failed to mention that and then uh, was sued because the client said, I didn't know it was illegal under federal law. And uh, yeah, I believe there was a disciplinary uh, action taken in that case. Um, I'm also increasingly seeing this not only in, in our engagement letters, but also just in general transactional uh, documents. So it, it's not that unusual now for your leases or uh, supplier contracts or investor agreements to include an advisement of counsel section um, that includes that very similar language. Uh, just so there is like no question, right? So even if you get into that question, uh, that question of, oh well, I thought you were representing all sides of the transaction, or I thought I could count on this as being a good legal document, or even in that situation, which is already like kind of questionable, you still have that big, bold, clear language that says this is federally illegal. Um, do you cover other states? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, we will get to a couple of the other opinions, which I'm happy to. So now, um, American Bar Association, well, the I mean, first thing you notice is the language is almost identical because, well, Vermont took it from the American Bar Association. Uh, but this does, after kind of some back and forth, uh, the ABA adopted uh, very similar language, basically stating uh, that this, as long as you are counseling on your state law, now, what you can't do is tell somebody how to avoid state law. You still cannot counsel them how to break state law. You must keep your counsel, your advice, your services 
to keep your clients within the guidelines of their state regulatory framework. A uh, couple of discussion questions. We're not going to spend a lot of time on these, but I just want you to start kind of thinking, percolating them uh, through your mind. Uh, laws on personal possession and use of marijuana and cannabis. If you are involved in this, you better know your state's laws. Uh, difference between decriminalization and legalization. It's the big one. People use them interchangeably. They are not. Decriminalization can mean there is still a civil violation, which can still have a ton of collateral consequences versus legalization. Um, advice on obtaining a business license to distribute cannabis, ethical concerns. How about another client, conflict of interest. These are huge issues that really need to be dealt with. It can be very different whether you're in a limited license jurisdiction where there's a cap versus an unlimited license jurisdiction where anybody who's qualified can get a license. Um, client using medical marijuana, client fails a drug test. Do they have the right to use it? Quick answer, no, there is no right to use cannabis. It is not covered under the ADA. Again, federal illegality versus federal law. Um, lawyer, you know, uses medical cannabis. Any issues? Um, definitely some things to be thinking about. Uh, rules that have caused the most concern debate to their application of lawyers to provide legal advice. Uh, 1.2D, we've covered that. Let's take a look at some of the others that might be implicated. Rule 8.4B. Sorry. Quick point oh, on 1.2D. Please, go right ahead. We have three states that don't agree. Um, <laughs> Georgia has said, which has a medical program, has said uh, cannabis is legal. Can't advise. Um, and, uh, and, and, and a couple other, Texas is another one, and, 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 and uh, South, South Dakota, Dakota was, I think that got reversed. Uh, yeah, so, and, and there have been challenges there. And you also just get funny results, right? So at one point, Connecticut had a, a bar, um, an, an ethics advisory opinion that said uh, attorneys may not advise on um, uh, cannabis businesses, and it, there was, I believe there was some overlap between the time when that uh, advisory opinion was extant and the existence of the Connecticut bar section on cannabis law. So, uh, you know, this is again another area where, where things are in flux, and, and we do see the, the adoption of that permissive language uh, happening in a few different ways. So do check for, with your specific jurisdiction because there can be a little bit of nuance there. Absolutely. And it is an important part to keep aware of. Um, none of us want a professional responsibility complaint. So know what your jurisdiction says and keep abreast because it changes a lot quickly. Uh, you'll find that in cannabis law every day, all practically, you're seeing new regulations in a new state, you're seeing things change, things morph. Um, very, very important to stay on top of all. Uh, current events in this industry. Things move very quickly. This is the job, right? Like, this is. It's part of what I love, but every day you kind of wake up and check the news to see what it is that the law, Which what the law is that you're an expert in. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, that, and that's going to come up more, right? Because we have some specific duties that, that apply there, but let's see what yeah, uh, so uh, 8.4b, professional misconduct for a lawyer to engage in a serious crime, defined as illegal conduct inv uh, involving any felony or any lesser crime is a necessary element of which involves interference with the administrative justice, false swearing, intentional misrepresentation, fraud, deceit, bribery, extortion, misappropriation, theft, or an attempt or a conspiracy, or a solicitation of another to commit a serious crime. Drug trafficking is a serious crime, <laughs> no question about it. And technically, under federal law, us as advisors are involved in a conspiracy to distribute a Schedule One controlled substance. Yes? So how do you reconcile that provision with an attorney who accepts ownership in a, in a company in, in payment for this? Marvelous question. How do you reconcile that with just an attorney who just accepts cannabis money as fees without an ownership stake? I mean, this is an excellent, excellent question. And this is the question that was posed to both the uh, you know, state bars as well as the American Bar Association. Um, and then we have 8.3a. Also, a lawyer who knows that another lawyer has committed a violation of the rules of professional conduct uh, shall inform the appropriate professional authority. So every other lawyer in the state is calling going, Ted Ferris, help them distribute marijuana. Uh, <laughs> you know, and this, is, this was a real serious question. And until it was addressed, there was just had a lot of lawyers uh, rather on edge. Um, I started my company uh, at the end of 2016. And <laughs> this is still kind of an unresolved question. Yes? I'm curious, um, I'm blanking on what the rule number is. Um, or the exact language, but basically it's the idea that if you have a, a young, either a, a law student 
or you know a new attorney who someone is supervising and they commit it's an ethically gray area they like are supposed to follow what their supervisor says but if it's not an ethically gray area and it's just wrong and the young lawyer does it they're you know held accountable under the rules um this feels pretty gray under state, state law but not under federal so i'm just curious being in a law school like if if someone had a BLS student there, like is that person potentially jeopardizing their legal career by listening to what their supervisor says? Uh, you know, we've had interns from BLS in our office, and I'd like to say no, most fall under a student practice license where the supervising attorney is responsible for the conduct until they are sworn in as a bar. Now, thankfully, in answer to your question, and to answer this question, is that the state bars have said, and the American Bar Association has said, or most state bars, uh, that it is acceptable. It is not a violation of these rules to accept money from a cannabis company or to counsel a cannabis company or to take equity in a cannabis company, as much as I disagree with that, as long as you are taking affirmative steps to make sure that, that client is conforming with state law. So they have taken the position of looking at the state law as opposed to the federal law. But With the plain language of what you just read, uh, you just said that it's a violation of the law, law, and we know that it's a violation of federal law. Yes, it is. Welcome to cannabis law. <laughs> I mean, welcome. This is this is this is the exciting part of playing this game, and it's not for every attorney. Because a lot of attorneys do feel this. This is why we are still the only cannabis law firm in this state. It's like Zimmerman. It's a lie, but not really. It is, well, but it's not. Some of the language yeah. I like that, uh, that Professor Chemerinsky uses, and I don't think it originates with him, is he says that, um, you know, when talking about the federalism issue, he says, um, you know, that uh, Congress has decided to tolerate the tension between the federal and the states. I, is it tolerating the tension, or is it really just that they can't agree? Like, we, we don't. We don't know, but as to the criminal enforcement side, essentially we're all relying on um, uh, prosecutorial discretion, and that could change at any moment. And that is absolutely um, the you know, in the same way that we have to ask our clients about their risk tolerance, it's a, it's a major question for attorneys as well. And, and you know, when I get asked about this, you know, I, I just want to get a little bit flip about it because it's like, okay, well, if someone's going to start enforcing against cannabis industry stakeholders. By the time they get to me, right, they've gone through all of the growers, all of the dispensaries, probably the state cannabis regulators, all of the major investors, all of the venture capitalists backing them, all of the big law firms that are now getting involved. Right? Like, it's, there's, there's a little bit of a, the train has left the station and we're waiting for the regulation to catch up. And the other two major well, issues. I agree exactly with the face that you're making because that's not what it was. Not what it says. Of course, the Constitution says police powers are reserved for the states. Well, the federal government should not have any. <laughs> just take two more minutes. I mean, I was an ethics officer for yep. a New York State agency, and I mean, and in a New York State agency where there was in New York, where there was a, an ethics law for the state, and my particular agency had its own law, which was much more stringent. Yeah. So, but what I used to say to the agency when I would give my own CLEs on ethics is that, you know, a lot of this is optics. How would it look if your mother read about your activities on the top half of the New York Times front page? And so optics plays a big part in this, I think, when we're talking about ethics. And a lot of what you've just said to me just resonates that way. It's crazy. Taking a stake in a company that you know is not legal to me invites a lot of trouble. Yes, it does. It just, <laughs> yeah, I don't, don't disagree. And to me, the optics are just, just says, no, Horrific. don't do it. It's really not ethical. And it, prevents a, it presents a conflict of interest, which is another whole other ethical area. Yeah, as, so, as, as to taking the stake, I. I Personally, 100% agree. You know, th there is another argument to be made here, as, just as to the interpretation of the rule, uh, of the ethics rule, as, as any individual state, right? Which is that we acknowledge that, for better or worse, we exist in a system where each state jurisdiction regulates its attorneys, and we also know that from a federalism perspective, we have this anti-commandeering principle, right? So we can't um, force the states to be in enforcing federal law, right? So if, if we take that interpretation, then we, we can say, well, does the state really have the authority to define a serious crime, you know, as uh, 
is a violation of the CSA that isn't a violation of state law. It, it's not an argument that's been made, fortunately, because I think then you could, could make that same argument for other like really terrible federal crimes that aren't addressed at the state level. But I think that would be the other rationale that could be raised. But to your point about op optics, I think you're absolutely right. And, and this is kind of another practice consideration that isn't strictly an ethics question, but it's something that we all need to think about. It's something that Tim dealt with, that I've dealt with as well, which is really, what are the implications for your personal reputation if you engage in this industry at any level? And, you're right? yeah. and, and it really depends. I can tell you, um, I, you know, I mentioned already, I practice in Oregon and Louisiana. Well, let me tell you, in Oregon, if you hold yourself out as a cannabis attorney, like, nobody bats an eye. Everybody's a cannabis <laughs> attorney, no matter what industry you're in, you have clients who are, who are um, in the cannabis industry. In Louisiana, very different situation. Very, very different situation. And so as, as you're re returning to your home jurisdictions, that's, that's something to think about. You know, uh, there, there are big opportunities here, uh, and particularly in this moment, but if you're holding yourself out as a cannabis attorney, or an emerging industries attorney, or an ag, ag attorney, or, or whatever the thing is, uh, it, it may have broader implications for who wants to do business with you. Um, and that's particularly worth thinking about because we're in a moment of great opportunity for, for the cannabis industry right now. A generation from now, it's gonna be another ag industry, right? Highly, it's gonna be another vice industry, right? We know what it looks like to be a wine lawyer. You know, and it's gonna feel a lot more like that. So that is something to be aware of. It is transitioning. When I started this, I my colleagues told me when I left my firm job to start from my kind of solutions. Everybody giggled. Everybody giggled. Yeah, I, yeah, I giggled. I, I was going to be disbarred. I was going to be prosecuted. I would never be a lawyer again. You know, and that has changed. We actually got invited right before the pandemic to speak at the uh, Vermont uh, Bar Association's bankruptcy division at their holiday party just because they were so curious. And that kind of like, uh, I know, right? <laughs> But it has, you know, it's gone to a curiosity now. Now we're more of like, you know, like a carnival show. Like, really, what do you guys do here? Um, but there is a stigma. I, I mean, I do not expect to uh, ever hear Judge Fair. Like, that, that ship has probably sailed for me moving into this area. Um, I don't think I'll ever be running for state's attorney in any county in the state. Um, but that's okay. And that's a decision that, you know, getting into this, you do have to realize there are ramifications still. There is still a stigma attached to cannabis. There are people who still view it as a dangerous drug. Um, there is a lot of bad data out there. There's a lot of bad scientific studies that are being held up uh, to demonstrate the dangers of marijuana, most of which, when you really get past the superficial level, are crap. But um, that's something to be aware of. And, you know, reputation and uh, professional uh, reputation, especially, can be impacted by getting into this area. We, um, I, I talk about this quite a bit with my students and, and, and with my colleagues, because I don't know how many of y'all experience, you know, Saturday, or, um, Friday CLEs in Vermont where like your presenters are wearing suits. I can tell you in the classroom here at VLS, that's not always the situation. And, and in the classroom, we talk quite a bit about the need for formality and the need to hold yourself to a higher standard. And when we talk about all of the different areas of law that are implicated in cannabis law and our obligation under Rule 1.1, which we haven't gotten to, but just generally to provide competent counsel and to, to meet those uh, base requirements, there is absolutely more scrutiny and there's absolutely more suspicion uh, because of this background advice and this this association with criminality, so that's something that we all have to be very mindful. Do you, yeah. you struggle to find, you know, I don't know, not necessarily co-counsel, but you know, if you're focusing on cannabis law and you need someone who focuses on business law or tax law or other types of law, do you struggle to find attorneys that are willing to work with you or to partner with you and your clients in those other areas of law? Yeah, in, in, in my and, and, uh, Tim, I know you can speak to Vermont. I can tell you, I, I, I practice nationally, and it, um, it really depends on the specific practice area. So generally speaking, um, when, when a new state legalizes, the folks who have connections to, folk, to people who are interested in becoming market participants tend to be criminal defense attorneys. We're very excited about the opportunity and not at all excited about administrative law, which is 90% of what we do. <laughs> so, um, there are often good partnerships available there, and sometimes those folks have established relationships. I can tell you the hardest for me personally, I don't know what your experience has been, is inviting accountants, right? Because when we talk about the banking industry being concerned, accountants are like doubly so, because they're in the business of like trying to, to manage risk within the banking. World, so that has certainly been the hardest, and and as a result, there's a little bit of a cottage industry sprouting of cannabis accounts in the same way that cannabis lawyers. Are right? Definitely, yeah. It's yeah. Two eighty specialists, yeah. and that's a sure. challenge. Even ones who want to do it, they're not, you know, really up to two eighty mitigation strategies. You're sending a client down a bad path. Yeah. Um, 
Thankfully, we have the International Cannabis Bar Association now. When I first joined in 2016, I think there were 200 members. We're now 800 members strong. Um, and that is a phenomenal resource because you can find now basically a cannabis practitioner in just about every area of law through the uh, INCBA. Um, and they can, it's, it's just been magnificent. I can't tell you the amount of times uh, I've turned uh, to the uh, roster to be able to find people to advise. Um, we were fortunate, my law partner and I were fortunate enough to be off counsel of a Hoban Law Group, which is one of the national uh, cannabis law firm, Bob Hoban, uh, started in Colorado. And they were also just a, a wonderful resource. So we kind of find each other. <laughs> Once you find somebody, you know, and then we kind of work together um, on issues. But you know, I, I was a criminal defense attorney, family law attorney. I was a trial attorney for seven years uh, before I got into this. Um, I, I did not know the first thing about writing an operating agreement in 2017. <laughs> now I think I've written about 200 of them. Um, you know, and a lot of it does come down to your ability to recognize the areas that you're not familiar with and take the time to learn them so you can meet the ethical responsibility of competence. Uh, it's also a matter of being able to tell your client, I don't know how to do that. Um, for, for the first two years I was doing the securities law. I didn't know anything about it. So I couldn't. Then I took a couple of CLE classes and I took a lot of time to learn, you know, what a party exemption is. And so now I do feel confident to be able to do basic, uh, you know, uh, security exemptions and what needs to be done. But you, not, you, know, you can't be afraid of telling your client, I don't know how to do that. A lot of lawyers don't want to say that. They don't want to farm out. They don't want to admit they don't know everything. Um, but you have to understand, know what you know, know what you don't know. And one of the best skills for a cannabis law attorney is to know where to go if you're not familiar, because this does touch on everything. Contract law, property law, securities law, you know, banking and finance, criminal law, I mean, all of them. It's such a wide spectrum. Again, why I've been so attracted to this is because you get the opportunity to practice in so many different areas. But don't ever try to tell your client you know how to do something when you don't, because they'll know it. <laughs> they'll know it. And uh, the chance of screwing something up is huge. So be aware of your limitations, and be aware to ask for help when you need it. Again, the INCBA is a fantastic organization. Very impressed with the way it's grown over the last few years. Started out as a National Cannabis Bar Association. Now there's members from Mexico, there's members uh, from Germany, um, all over the world now. It's, uh, it's a great organization. A um, couple of follow-up points. One, I, I, I fully agree with that endorsement. Also, many uh, states now have um, uh, cannabis bar sections. Um, of the bar association. Vermont doesn't because we all, there's five of us. Ben and I were just looking at each other like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. that, you know, is what it is. But, um, uh, you know, I, I, two other quick points on that. One, on the compliance side, when you're advising clients, there's going to be stuff where uh, knowing the law involves telling your clients about considerations that just aren't legal. So the, the, the one that always I, I think about is, is anytime you're applying for a license and as part of your ongoing compliance duties, um, you have to submit and follow what are called standard operating procedures, which is stuff like what are our security systems going to look like? What is our HVAC system going to look like? What is our fire management going to look like? And that's not the practice of law, right? So at some point, the, it, it becomes are we, cons are, are we providing those business consulting services and educating ourselves separately on that? Or are we discharging our ethical duty by giving the client the checklist and saying, well, at the end, I want to see what you come up with and write it up to make sure that you're not doing stuff that we know is a violation of the fire code. We know you're not um, doing uh, concentrated extracts with uh, light hydrocarbons, which are explosive and banned in most jurisdictions, right? We know you're not uh, engaging in some of those practices where, where there's a specific law that we can point to. But as to, like, what's the best air conditioning system to use? Like, that's not a question of law, and I need, as a lawyer, I need you to know that that's a consideration. But where are we gonna draw those lines? Um, and uh, Ethics Rule 1.2c lets us limit the scope of our representation, and my engagement letters tend to be extremely explicit about this is what I will advise you on, this is what I will not advise you on. Um, with, uh, some, sometimes with bigger projects, we'll do like a master engagement letter and then subsidiary uh, project specific ones, right? That'll say, work will not begin on this project until we have clearly defined the scope. And bear in mind, they do have to provide informed consent for each of those scope limitations. So that is hugely important in this area because again, also often unsophisticated clients who say, well, you're my lawyer, right? So, mm -hmm. so we do want to be, we do want to be careful. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, so what have some other states done? Um, you know, this is an opportunity to take a look and what we're going to find is, Majority of the states have actually kind of fallen along the ABA uh, guidelines. 
Uh, March 2014, Colorado, obviously the first uh, laboratory uh, experimentation, first state to really legalize adult use cannabis. Granted, California was de facto legalization, but it wasn't actually officially legalized until 2018. Uh, and the Colorado Supreme Court, in uh, basically reaction to the legalization, uh, came out with their comment 14 to Rule 1.2D, Florida May Council of Client regarding the validity, scope, and meaning of Colorado Constitutional Article 18, Sections 14 and 16, their cannabis legalization laws, and they assist the client in conduct that the lawyer reasonably believes is permitted by these constitutional provisions, statutes, regulations, orders, and other state or local provisions implementing them. Uh, in these circumstances, the lawyer shall also advise the client regarding related federal law and policy. Again, the caveat, must inform your client. Keep that in mind, very important. Illinois, uh, following in October, this was a few years before they passed legalization, but seeing it on the horizon, um, a couple of questions that were posed to the Bar Association there. May a lawyer provide legal advice and services to a client engaged in the medical marijuana business that is legal under state but remains a crime under federal law? And yes, given the conflict between state and federal law and the federal accommodations in Cole, which is the Cole Memorandum, for those of you I think at this point are probably pretty familiar with that, that was kind of the <laughs> guidance document which every state utilized to justify legalization here. Um, <laughs> It's far better than forcing such clients and businesses to proceed by guesswork. And I think that's about as straightforward as it gets. You know, you've got a state legal industry. You can't expect people to navigate this without legal guidance. If you prevent lawyers from helping them, how are they supposed to do this legally? I mean, it's, you know, the chicken and the egg scenario. Um, however, tread carefully. Make sure it's not a front for traffickers. And remember, feds can change their mind at any time. In 2014, that was a very real possibility. I think in 2022, I can safely say that ship has sailed. Uh, I, I think should the federal you know, DOJ decide to all of a sudden start to enforce cannabis laws, I, I, think, I don't think that's actually possible uh, at this point. Um, it's just too big of an industry. There is just too much. There is just too many states now. You know, we are supposedly a representative democracy, right? Well, when over 66% of our country lives in a state of legal jurisdiction, there does come a question, at what point does this just become silly? Uh, and I do believe, I, you know, my own personal opinion, we've reached that point now. Um, may a lawyer counsel in municipal government concerning zoning regulations for cultivation centers and dispensaries, of course, not even a close call. Enacting zoning regulations is not a crime, no matter what builders, property owners, and occupants might be authorized to do. Surprisingly enough, this is still an objection we get uh, here in Vermont, I just <laughs> just had a zoning hearing in St. Johnsbury where the zoning administrator said one of their concerns is that the federal government was going to come in and arrest them for zoning cannabis. <laughs> no, no, no. That is one thing you do not need to worry about. Um, Alaska, 2015, another one of the uh, very first states to legalize. Great question. Personal use by an attorney. <laughs> Can attorneys line up in a legal jurisdiction? Thank God. Uh, okay, as long as consistent with state law and does not result in impairment. Just like anything else. Can a lawyer have a beer? Of course. Can you have a beer before you go into court to represent your client? Probably not a great idea. <laughs> I don't know if y'all knew this, but some lawyers were smoking pot even before it was legal in their state. No. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> uh, can attorneys advise clients on forming a business to legal under state law? Yes. So long as the attorney, again, you're going to see some common threads here. Uh, make sure to advise the client that state law conflicts with federal law. Um, can a lawyer drop the LLC paperwork, invest financially in the business, or work there? Uh, no principal line between giving advice and drafting documents, which makes sense. You can give advice, but I can't draft your contract. That would not make a whole heck of a lot of sense. Now, as far as investing or working there, this comes back to my point. Lawyers should exercise, I would say, extreme caution uh, and not become directly involved in operating a business that remains illegal under federal law. This was Alaska's take on it. Frankly, I think it's a very good take. Um, I do not, again, and I will keep saying this all day, I do not agree with lawyers taking a stake in their clients' businesses. Um, now, again, uh, we are starting an ancillary business ourselves, uh, doing a wholesale distribution company that me and my law partner are partners in. But that was not with a client. That was on us, on our own, deciding to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, going into business with a client, I, I just, I will never think that's a good idea under any circumstances. Washington State, 2014, uh, again, comment 18 to rule 1.2. 
uh, at least until there is a subsequent change of federal enforcement policy, a lawyer may counsel a client regarding the validity, scope, and meaning of Washington Initiative 502, their legalization. I love the little guy, at least until there's a subsequent change of federal enforcement policy. So it kind of gives them an out. Uh, but again, you're seeing that common thread. State legality. Make sure they're aware of the federal illegality. This is what's important. Transparency and communication with your clients. A um, couple other questions posed to the Washington uh, State Bar. Ethically bypossessed marijuana. Possessional use is okay. No reason to interpret the rules as prohibiting lawyers from engaging in conduct that is legal for everyone else. The caveat, of course, impairment, common sense. You don't show up to work drunk. You don't show up to work stoned. You don't show up to work incapacitated on prescription medications. Very basic, very common sense, but you know, important to know that this is what the uh, state has said. So may a client run a marijuana-related business that is legal under state law. Operating marijuana-related businesses are okay. Lawyers are free to engage in the business to the same extent as members of the public. Caveat, rule 1.8, if going into business with the client. Again, big flashing red lights. Uh, every state has noted this. They allow it, but they do say it's probably not a great idea. Could not agree more. Um, yeah, so, so just um, just one quick thing to, to point out there is, is note that we're, we're seeing these opinions coming out in a lot of different formats, right? So Alaska ended up um, enacting their own Rule 1.2F. In Connecticut, they've got a 1.2D3. In Florida, they have a non-disciplinary policy, right? And others, we have uh, advisory opinions. So when you're looking at your jurisdiction, you might have to do a little look at Or um, I don't know if any of y'all have experienced this, but I, throughout my career, have been um, very happy to reach out to the local ethics council whenever I had a question about anything, uh, and certainly have developed some relationships with them. Uh, so I would encourage you truly to uh, to explore that um, because it, it's not always as simple as just saying, well, let's pull off the rules of professional hobby. Um, yeah, we got, we got like five minutes left. Do we wanna, um, are there questions? Are there, yeah. I'm curious if you could talk about advising your clients on like using a gifting policy. So like in DC, there's a the gifting policy, right? You're not buying it, you're buying a yeah, sticker or something like that. Excellent question. Gifting is, you know, a, for those of you who don't know, Gifting is a kind of scheme in which you go in and buy a t-shirt for $100 and get a free gift of a quarter ounce of uh, <laughs> marijuana cannabis. Uh, you know DC. Happens in DC. Yes, DC, I mean, that, was, that is what has been basically going on in DC. They have juice bars, you can get a you know, $50 glass of juice with an eight. Jurisdictions address that uh, individually. When we first passed legalization in 2018 here in Vermont, we legalized home grow, possession, and use. We did not have a commercial system. Within six weeks, T.J. Donovan called me into his office and said, we are not allowing gifting to people. <laughs> 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 we are not allowing gifting. Um, you know, technically it's a runaround. It is still an exchange of money for the product. DC has allowed it. Okay. Uh, they have accepted that. Uh, DC is very pissed off that they are not allowed to make their own determinations. Legalization needs to be done by Congress because of the particular nature of Washington, DC. So they said, all right, well, if you're not gonna let us do it, we're gonna allow this. Uh, some jurisdictions have allowed that. Uh, New York was kind of <laughs> not officially allowing it, but pretty much allowing it. Um, but for the most part, that is not a valid runaround. Donations are another one you hear. Oh, I'm not charging anything. I'm just accepting donations for my free gifts. There's money crossing and there's product crossing. That is a sale, uh, generally under UCC definitions, uh, and that will uh, generally be illegal. Um, it's just whether the jurisdiction chooses to enforce it or not. Yeah, and you know, if I'm advising a client, it's really the same 1.2 conversation. It's, look, here, you're, what is your risk tolerance, right? This is the potential risk you run. Even if, like, if you're in DC or whatever, and maybe you're gonna win in court, you're still gonna have to go to court, right? You're still risking arrest. You're still risking this uh, civil penalty, whatever the thing is. And this is a client I've had, uh, this is a conversation I've had with many clients, not just cannabis clients throughout my career, is essentially what you can, you may be able to, you might be legally right, it still sucks to go to court, right? So you have to decide whether it's worth that specific risk, given what we know so far about this specific industry and this jurisdiction in this moment. And as a criminal, before a criminal defense attorney, a current criminal defense attorney, I would not want to try to convince the judge of why uh, my donation is not a sale. No, Your Honor, I swear I wasn't selling it. I was just getting a donation. Yeah, probably not. 
Any other questions? Oh, come on. Somebody's got a question now? Yeah. Ah, yes. The mic you're referring to, his last name I missed right after I walked oh, in the right Michael place. Kennedy. He was a former disciplinary prosecutor here in the state of Vermont. He is now uh, our uh, professional responsibility counsel. Basically, now he just you can call him up and ask him any ethical question, and he will answer. And he is just a wonderful human being. Is he the last guy? Uh, I don't think so. I don't know. Okay. I know he runs marathons. I know he's one of the nicest <laughs> human beings in the world. That's, that's about my extent of, uh, you know. Brilliant, yeah. <laughs> um, but very, very good resource if you do practice in Vermont, not just cannabis law, any ethical law. Mike is so willing to talk, to have you come in, sit down. If you ever have an ethical concern, uh, I cannot stress what a great resource he is. And a question back. You mentioned Heritage Market. Is that the main name for the black market? So, do you want to address that? We call it legacy, heritage, you know, these are terms we try to stay away from the term black market, again, connotation of, you know, given where this history of prohibition has come from, um, not yes. a great. Well, that's the issue, right? When we talk about cannabis, we're talking about a, a product that has been selectively bred over generations in the U.S. and many under... Uh, prohibition and many of the folks who were pioneers in that industry, many of the folks who shaped pop culture, many of the folks who really got the, the cultural acceptance of cannabis that led to this wave of legalization have been or are currently incarcerated. So, um, you know, there are times when, when we refer to the, the, the illicit market or the heritage market or the, the legacy market, depending on, um, on what we're talking about, but, but when we talk about words like heritage and legacy, Right. That's what we're talking about. Is is really how did we get to this point? Let's acknowledge that. And let's not let that be excluded from the conversation. And, and given where the time is at, you know, I think I think maybe this is a good point to 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 kind of wrap up on that point. Is like you know, I I, I know you all in this room are aware that the VLS recently kind of announced his recommitment to these um, ideas of, of environmental and economic and racial and social justice and more, in my opinion, than in any other practice area, this is where it all comes together. And uh, I, I'll say as a newcomer to VLS, I have been so impressed with how um, alumni, you have met, many folks who you know, are really going out and making change as, as regulators, as transactional attorneys. Um, Tim is, is, is being fairly humble in that he, he pretty much like runs the legal world for, for Vermont Cannabis and, um, and has very much earned that. Um, through, his, through his hard work and also his commitment to, um, to this community, right? When you hear about him talking about uh, the International Cannabis Bar Association when, when he participates in these alumni events, um, we're really seeing a community build and we're seeing BLS alums being a huge part of that community and really having a lot of influence. So thank you all for that and I do hope you'll um, continue to participate. I'm sure other people ask you for money or whatever. That, that's not what I'm talking about. Like, <laughs> like when, you know, I just finished teaching cannabis law and, and most of our guest speakers were, were VLS alums. Mm -hmm. And our students were so excited to be part of this practice area and to be exploring it as scholars. Uh, and, and I'm also fielding those inquiries from other alums who are interested in entering the area. Uh, and the network that you all have built and continue to maintain is truly inspiring. I went to a different law school. I'd like to very much. We do not have this kind of camaraderie. <laughs> and I really celebrate it. Uh, you all for that, and I, and I do hope that you'll continue to explore this area because really, I believe that some of the changes being made here and some of the opportunity to make money and still have a heart is is a model that, that uh, could, be, could be duplicated elsewhere. Nobody should have ever been incarcerated for cannabis at any point in our history. And it was used for thousands of years before this ridiculous prohibition. And now, yes, it's a business. Yes, people are making money, but we're also seeing that change, whether it comes with expungements, whether it comes with... Um, you know, not prosecuting people and putting them in jail for a plant anymore. Uh, you know, this is one of those areas in which we really can make a difference and we can make a change. Uh, the drug war was ridiculous. It never should have happened. Drug addiction is a health issue, not a criminal justice issue. And I think more and more people, as we get past the stigma, are seeing that. And I think we are seeing some change. And this is an area of law in which the more comfortable people get, the more normalized they get, the more education they get. They learn the propaganda they've been fed for 70 years. It's nothing but you know smoke and mirrors. Uh, this is an area in which we can see uh, some systemic change in our system, and I really hope moving forward uh, a lot of you can see that. Uh, one last question here in the corner. Uh, actually, just uh, Andy Lane. I'm the vice president for alumni relations here. I wanted to thank Tim and Ben for 
what I know was a very informative talk, and thank all of you for attending and being present here at Reunion. The next event takes place starting in about 10 minutes. It's sort of meet the deans and senior leaders. It's out behind Devavoy's under the white tent. Everyone is welcome. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Andy. Thank you. Um, feel free to reach out to me, Tim Fair from my kind of solutions. If you have any other questions, I love talking about this. If you didn't notice, so if you need a call, shoot me an email. Happy to help. Anybody wants to get licensed, let me know too. <laughs>